actually did part of the screencast already and then had to start it over because my daughter pointed out to me that I had an inappropriate saying on my shirt. So I've turned my shirt inside out and now we can get started. Macro Unit 1, Screencast 3, still in this unit called Indicators of Economic Performance. This screencast is about shortcomings of GDP and about something called the business cycle. All right, so up to this point, we've talked about GDP as a measure of how the economy is doing, but there are a lot of problems with GDP if we're gonna use GDP as a measure of our well-being, especially. So I'm gonna talk about some of those problems and then we're gonna talk about um, the business cycle. Now, one problem with GDP is that it doesn't capture non-market transactions. Again, if money doesn't change hands, that isn't captured as a part of GDP. So work done for ourselves, whether we're a house husband or a housewife, um, that kind of stuff isn't captured as a part of GDP, but it really should be captured because it's production. You know, when I go and do my dishes in my house, I'm performing a service for my family. Or if I build a deck onto my house, or if I repair my own car, I'm providing a good service, it's a, uh, I'm adding to the economy, but it's not really going to be captured as a part of GDP, again, just for practical reasons. It's hard for anyone to know that I did my own dishes or what it's worth uh, financially. So this is um, a problem with GDP. It means that the GDP number is not going to be as high as it really is because we're not capturing all these transactions. And I think this is an outgrowth of the male-dominated field of economics, or at least male-dominated through the 20th century, where males weren't really thinking about stuff that women primarily did, at least early in the 20th century. Things like housework, you know, child rearing, dishwashing, cleaning, that kind of stuff. Um, didn't seem that important to the economists, didn't get captured as a part of GDP. All right, the second problem with GDP is that it doesn't capture leisure. We get a lot of value, a lot of utility out of not working, not producing stuff. I mean, personally, um, you know, I'm a pretty lazy guy and I like my leisure. Um, so, you know, if I live in a world where I have lots of leisure, but I don't produce that much, GDP is going to look like it's kind of low, even if everybody's happy. So again, GDP is a very materialistic measure. It just measures the amount of stuff that we make, goods and services. So other stuff that makes us happy, like leisure, doesn't get captured. Um, and again, if GDP is supposed to be a proxy for our well-being, then it's going to be an underestimate. It also doesn't capture improved product quality. It just captures the dollar value of goods and services produced. So every year, computers get better, for example. And also every year, the price of computers tends to go down. So when I go and buy a computer today for $400, I'm getting a much, much better computer than I would have gotten 10 years ago for $400. But if I'm spending $400 in each of those years, GDP would only be $400 higher in each of those years. In other words, it would look like GDP was the same from that transaction, but it's really not because a better product is going to make me happier. GDP also doesn't capture the underground economy. Think of that as the black market. Any goods that are illegal, for obvious re reasons, aren't counted by the government when they're bought or sold. So things like prostitution, drugs, that kind of stuff, isn't going to get captured as a part of GDP. Now to just give you an indication of how big this number is, um, this is a little graph of shadow economies as a percentage of GDP. Um, to what extent are illegal transactions, uh, in dollar terms, how big are they in terms of the overall economy? And you can see Latvia, Estonia, Bulgaria, there are estimates that black market transactions are up to 40% of all the transactions in those countries. And even if you go down to places like Japan or the United States, you're looking at 5 to 10% of all the transactions being illegal transactions. So GDP is going to be a lot lower than it actually is because we're not counting all these transactions. Um, little pop quiz question for you. Uh, what is the largest cash value crop west of the Mississippi? It is marijuana. And they know that uh, not because they've actually found all the marijuana. If they found it, they would have gotten rid of it. They can tell that by pollen counts. They can measure the pollen in the air and get an estimate of exactly how much stuff must be being produced. 
And the dollar value of marijuana is estimated to be that greater than that of soybeans or corn or wheat. So that's a pretty big chunk of the um, economy. You know, we're not counting some pretty big um, production. And if GDP is supposed to be a measure of the amount of stuff that we're able to produce, and we're not counting all this stuff we're producing, GDP is going to be an underestimate. By the way, when I retire, I'm retiring in like Latvia or Estonia because it seems like they have some uh, good times going on there. All right, so doesn't capture underground economy. GDP also doesn't capture the damage done by externalities. So for example, a car might get produced and maybe it's sold for $25,000. GDP would go up by $25,000. But if we damage the environment along the way or if we cause other destruction along the way, if we pollute our rivers and oceans and air, that doesn't get captured as a part of GDP which again is another shortcoming of GDP. It's a very materialistic measure and it doesn't capture these ex externalities. GDP also doesn't care about the composition or the distribution of the stuff that we produce, meaning that it doesn't really care what we produce or who gets it. All GDP cares about is producing more stuff. So we might produce $10 worth of baby food, in which case GDP would go up by $10. Or we might produce a million dollars worth of poison. If we produce a million dollars worth of poison, GDP is going to look a lot higher. And it's going to look like we're making a lot more stuff, which we are. But it's not necessarily stuff we want to be making or stuff that's going to make us happy. So again, GDP doesn't care what we make. It just wants us to make lots of stuff. And in a sense, GDP would prefer a world where we made a trillion dollars worth of nuclear missiles and chemical weapons versus flowers and hugs. Well, you can't make hugs. Well, I can make a hug, actually. But, uh, you know, good stuff. And then finally, getting back to hugs, non-economic sources of well-being. GDP is a materialistic measure. So that to the extent that things like love, happiness, religious experience, friends, to the extent that that stuff matters to you, GDP is going to be a relatively poor proxy for well-being. All right, well, now that we've gone through the shortcomings of GDP, we're going to start talking about what is known as economic growth, which you can think of simply as making more stuff. Again, if the problem is scarcity, one of the ways to solve that problem is to make more stuff and eliminate that scarcity. So economic growth is one of the prime values behind macroeconomics. We want to see economic growth, not just because we have scarcity now, but also because populations increase. And as populations increase, we need to make more stuff just to have the same standard of living that we had the year before. So growth is a goal for the economy. And what we want to see, and this is a number that you actually have to know, is growth in the range of 3 to 4%. We want GDP to be going up by 3 to 4% a year, not only because populations rise, but also because that's essentially uh, what has been the typical rate of growth for a modern industrialized economy for the last 50 years or so. If we see GDP going up by less than 3 to 4 percent, the economy is doing pretty badly. And if it's going up by more than that, the economy is doing pretty well. Now another way we can try to capture how well we're doing is not simply by looking at what happens to GDP, which is just an overall number for the nation. Perhaps a better measure would be to look at GDP per capita, GDP per person. So for example, if you're living in Liechtenstein or whatever that has two people in it, if they have a GDP of a million dollars, that means they're making $500,000 per person worth of stuff, which is pretty good. We might have a billion dollar GDP in the United States, it's actually much more than that, but since we have 315 or so million people, that's a lot less stuff per person. So GDP number, just straight up GDP number, might be a good way to measure like the economic power of the country as a whole, or maybe even its military power, how, much, how many tanks it might be able to buy. But GDP per capita is really a better measure of how well we're doing per person, the extent to which we're satisfying the problem of scarcity for each individual in the country. Now, 
To help us understand economic growth rates and the impact that they have, I have to introduce a mathematical rule to you, which is called the rule of 70, which by the way is really the rule of 72, but we're gonna simplify it as the rule of 70. This is a nice little shortcut we can use to figure out the impact of different growth rates. It's a shortcut measure of how long it takes something to grow. What you do is you take the rate of growth of something and you divide it into the number 70. And what you're gonna get is how many years it's gonna take that thing to double. So for example, if I tell you that my wages are going up by 10% a year, and I wanna figure out how long it's gonna take my wages to double, I take the number 70, I divide it by the number 10, 10%, which would equal seven. If my wages go up by 10% a year, it'll take me seven years for my wages to double, for my income to double. Now with that in mind, let me show you the growth rates of some various countries around the world. These are recent growth rates, but they're also pretty typical for these countries over the last 10, 20, 30 years. You notice that the United States <clears throat> in the last quarter, I think it was, was at 1.6% growth rate, which is a little under what we want it to be, 3 to 4%. Places like Germany, 2.5%. But look at China at 9.1%. And start thinking about that rule of 70. If you want to figure out how long it's going to take the United States' economy to double, we take the number 70, divide it by 1.6, and that would give us some number. And I don't have a calculator in front of me, but that's how long it would take the United States' economy to double. Now do the same thing with China. And you could start to see why it is that everyone's talking about China so much. I'm just going to round 9.1% to 10% because I could do that in my head. Given these growth rates, China's economy is doubling, literally, roughly every seven years. I want to show you a graph um, that will show you exactly what's been going on with China. Um, this is a graph of GDP, and what you're going to see is what's happening to the U.S.'s and China's GDP from 1800 all the way through to the present. When I press play, watch the dots. Um, the yellow dot is the United States, and the red dot is going to be China. All right, so year 1820, things are pretty much even. 1830, again, things pretty much even, going along. Middle of the 19th century now. And now we're up to almost the year 1900. Here, the Industrial Revolution takes off, and you can see the U.S. starting to take off little dips in the Great Depression there, but here after World War II we really get going. Looks like we're going to dominate, but watch what China does over the very last 10-20 years. Oh my. You can see what's happening, and you can see that the lines are going to meet pretty soon, and you can see why it is that everyone is so concerned about uh, China's growth, and how they're very likely going to overtake us if the trends continue. I'll put a link to this map so you can play around with some of the things in this map and change some of the conditions if you want to on uh, the website. All right, I just spliced that in there. All right, so let's talk about the main sources of growth. Where does this growth come from? Well, it can really come from only two places. One place would be to find more resources. So to find new sources of labor, new sources of land, to use that stuff to produce more stuff. The problem with that is that we've pretty much explored the world at this point. We're not very good space explorers, and it's unlikely we're going to find vast new sources of oil or land or other things that we use to make stuff. The other place that we get more uh, stuff or more growth is by more productivity, which means doing more with what we already have. And in fact, historically, over the last 30 years or so, about one third of our growth has come from finding more resources. And about two thirds of our growth has come from just doing more with what we already have. Things like the internet, technology, information revolution have all kind of helped us do that. All right, well, this finally brings us to what's known as the business cycle. The business cycle is kind of a mapping out of what happens to GDP over time. Now if you look at this graph, the horizontal axis is time, 
and the vertical axis is level of real output, real output being a synonym for GDP, how much stuff we produce. Now what we want to see for an economy is a slow steady rise in GDP. What we want to see is something like this blue line. We want GDP to go up over time, again, grow at a rate of 3 to 4 percent, and we want it to do it pretty smoothly. Now that's not actually what happens with GDP. When we look at GDP over time, what we actually see happen is that it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. Now that's worse for an economy because that means that people's lives are being messed with. So the green line that you see is what's known as a business cycle. And we divide the business cycle into four distinct phases. When GDP is rising, like it is here, or it is here, we call that an expansion or a recovery. It means that GDP is getting bigger, that we're satisfying more wants and needs. And that happens over time. In the 1990s, for example, this was happening. Now at some point we hit a peak, top level of GDP. And you could look at that either one of two ways. If you're a glasses half full kind of person, you could say, hey, we're at a peak. If you're a glasses half empty person, you could say, oh no, we're at a peak. Because after a peak comes a recession. A recession happens when GDP falls for two straight quarters. That's six months. Each quarter is three months long. So if we see GDP falling for six straight months, we officially call that a recession. And that is terrible because not only are we making less stuff, again, remember that populations tend to rise over time. So we're making less stuff with more people. That means less satisfaction of wants and needs. That means more scarcity. And in a recession, as businesses produce less stuff, you could think about what that would mean for things like employment, right? If businesses are making less stuff, they're going to need less people to make it, and we start seeing people getting fired, etc. So recessions are bad, and we want to avoid them. Nevertheless, they happen. Now, at some point, recessions end. GDP stops falling. It gets as low as it's going to be for a while, and we call that a trough. And again, you could look at that one of two ways. Glass is half full person, we're going to go up. Glass is half empty person, oh no, we're at a trough. All right, so again, the idea is that we want the economy to grow slowly and steadily, kind of like the blue line. What it actually does, what GDP actually does, is kind of go up and down, like the green line. Now you'll notice that the green line and the blue line start and end in the same spot. And so you can think of one of the goals of macroeconomics and one of the goals of government involvement in the economy is to try to compress the green line into being the blue line. In other words, get rid of the big ups and downs. If we're going to wind up in the same spot anyway, we'd like to do it in a smooth, steady fashion. We don't want to go through these booms and busts where people are getting jobs and losing jobs, businesses opening and closing. Because even though we're winding up at the same spot, if you happen to be getting out of college right here, you're kind of screwed. Or if you happen to be retiring right there, you might be kind of screwed. And we want to try to even out those big bumps, give people more, prediction, more predictable uh, circumstances in their lives. All right, well, here's some actual data I just thought I'd show you before we ended the screencast of what GDP's been doing since roughly 1990. And these are in percentage terms. So any bar above the line is a growth and any bar below the line is a reduction in GDP and you can see what everyone's been talking about over the last number of years over here um, and how bad the economy is actually done all right that's it so is it any wonder people are afraid of technology technology oh my God.